drag racing fan, let's put the fire in the pipes and light it. This is Between the Slicks. Hello, I'm the Monday Morning Racer, Lee Craft, your host right here on the Monday Morning Racer platform, Facebook page, Twitter, and YouTube is where you can view this weekly live drag racing talk show. If you would, coming in, hit the like button for me on no matter what platform that you are watching it on. Retweet, share, definitely dive into the comments. And if you're watching on the YouTube channel, subscribe for a lot of great drag racing content. Hello to you all. Just like Drag Racing Central says MMR, Pat Lard says, good to see you, Lee. Good to see you, Pat. Well, I, I can't see you, but good to have you on the show tonight. And we have got another good one, I believe, lined up. We are going to have the 2021 AGAS, Southeast Gasters Association champion on once again, because he is the most recent winner in Southeast Gasser Association competition at Farmington Dragway in North Carolina for the event that they just had this past weekend. So Gabriel Burrell, he was going to be on the show with us. He drives that beautiful Southern Flyer, Kazi powered machine. And it is a joy to always talk to him. It is very intriguing, I think, the situation that he is in in Southeast Gasser Association competition currently. We're definitely going to talk to him about that and what it is going to take to win another championship in the A-Gas category of the Southeast Gasser Association. And speaking of the Southeast Gasser Association, I do want you to know that right here on the Monday Morning Racer YouTube channel, you can see Southeast Gasser Association action from all of their classes that regularly compete, minus H-Gas and the AFX category. I do got to take a little bit of a break. The show is ran so well, the Southeast Gasser Associations, it's hard to just switch lanes or get another angle or switch things up or take a little bit of a break. That's a good thing. But yes, you can already see the A-Gas elimination video, B-Gas full elimination video. The C-Gas full elimination video came out today and tomorrow. Expect the Super Stock, my favorite class, by the way, the Super Stock full elimination video to drop on the Monday Morning Racer YouTube channel. But if you want to see Southeast Gasser Association action live make sure to subscribe to their youtube channel southeast gassers and you can do so there so ladies and gentlemen i also want to announce before we dive into the uh, opinion piece the burn down and i've got a strong one today on between the slicks and before we dive into drag racing news a lot of news in the world of drag racing out there before we have our guest, Gabriel Burrell, the Southeast Gasser Association, on around the half hour mark, around 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time, that's when we'll have him, I do have an announcement. So, I started Monday Morning Racer about three years ago, and the channel has grown, it has expanded. I mean, granted, the channel has not blown up. I would like for it to be larger, but... There has been consistent growth. One, in this announcement, I do expect that we're going to have some big names coming on the show from the World Drag Racing, beginning at the 100th episode through the 110th episode. Going to try to have some big names, really push things forward and get some different stories and hear from some people that you might not have never heard of, just like we do right here, as usual, on between the slicks because it's not just about the drivers it's not just about the biggest names in the sport everyone in drag racing has got a story and they're playing a part in it and we want to get their stories but after starting monday morning racer i have i realized that hey i've got to do more than just interview people i remember the first time i went to atlanta dragway atlanta drag dragway excuse me for the Southern Nationals, I took a camera. I just interviewed whoever I could. I got Eric Enders that day, Clay Milliken, Ron Cap, Steve Torrance, Alex Laughlin, uh, Andy Rawlings. And I think I'm missing a few. 
And I was like, yes, I can do this. But I also realized that with interviews, you needed some other footage. So I said, well, I'll start filming. And I started filming races. And I started capturing other footage to add to the interviews and do other pieces beyond just straight interviewing someone. And then I realized, well, I need good looking thumbnails. And sometimes it was very challenging to find a good picture, especially when you went to a local track or a venue like Southeast Gasters Association or sometimes Funny Car Chaos. So I decided, okay, I also need to pick up photography. So I picked up a an actual camera, learned how to use it, turn the dials and the buttons and get the settings just right. And opportunity after opportunity and after opportunity uh, became available to me to work for top fuel teams and the social media side of things, to become a pit reporter with Funny Car Chaos and be associated with some great brands within the world of drag racing. The one place in the multimedia works that I have not done yet in drag racing is announcing and it's funny that that has not been the case because i encountered bob fry an hra announcer at the track for many many years at the southern nationals and i asked him hey how can a young man get into announcing that was my initial starting avenue all right and he explained to me hey you go to your local track you volunteer you get on the mic you learn the cars and you start from there. Well, it's interesting. It's kind of come full circle, but as it stands now, I am going to get my first opportunity to announce a drag race. So they are in their 15th year of operation, the Great Lakes Nostalgia Funny Car Circuit. And at Keystone Raceway, which is outside of Pittsburgh, the Good Vibrations Motorsports Funny Car Nationals on July 9th which is a Saturday, they have tapped me to announce this particular drag race. And I am looking forward to that. So if you're anywhere near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and uh, you would like to hear, not necessarily see, but hear me announce the Funny Car Nationals there at Keystone Dragway, well, come on down because it's either going to be spectacular or it's going to be a spectacular crash and burn, one or the other. But I am looking forward to it. I am looking forward to it. That is going to be a blast. Well, look, before we get to the burn down section of the show, let me go through some comments here. Thomas Michael Sebolt, your shows keep getting better. Great interviews. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. And that is the goal, to keep improving, continual improvement. I think if you look at the first show, that was ever a between the slicks to hopefully this one. I hope people definitely see improvement. And that's all we can expect out of each other is improvement. I don't think anyone is ever at the top. I think there's always another level and another polishing element and another sharpening element, if you will, to what we do, especially our talents and abilities. Uh, Dalton says, hey, from Monroe, Ohio. Thank you for wa watching, Dalton. Drag Racing Central. MMR has Sega and FS FCC. Ever thought about doing an event together? I think the two series would blend really well. I think they would. Now, Quain has some particular rules on where Southeast Gasser Association guys can go and can run. And I understand those rules. There is an example of them running exhibition races. For example, I filmed them one year at Steel in Motion at Union Dragway. It wasn't the full field of Sega cars, and it wasn't a points meet. So there might be a day in which Funny Car Chaos is on the East Coast with many East Coast Funny Car goers and Sega. You never know what might work out. I know this, Quain Stott did want to talk with my boss over there at Funny Car Chaos, Chris Graves, just bounce off some promoting ideas. It is fascinating that you have these two groups within drag racing. They are wildly different. They're in two different areas. One is doing it with strict rules, and one is doing it with just be a funny car, run what you brung, and yet they're being both wildly successful. There's a model there in both of them for sure. Oh, let's see very quickly, very quickly. Kenny Trent says, those racers are very approachable if you do it with respect and they know you respect them. Well, I try to. I try to and definitely, definitely want to get their story. And I think one of the elements with racers is that 
they want to know you've got their back. Are you going to just do like this hit piece? Or are you going to actually lift them up in some way and tell their story? Even if it was traumatic, let's say they blew it up. How are you going to tell that story? And that makes a difference. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this show is brought to you by Destroyer 1320 and their theft deterrent systems. If you would, pay very close attention to the break upcoming. And after this, we're going to dive in to the burn down. If you own a beautiful modern muscle car like this 1320 Challenger, I'm sure you don't want it stolen. Because the Challenger and many other modern vehicles have an easily accessible neutral release strap. That was your coin holder in your central console. And beneath that, there's this red cord that someone can pop, put it in the neutral, and potentially easily steal your car. But at Destroyer1320.com, they have the TDS theft deterrent system, which is a cover over that strap using factory mounting points so that you don't get popped by a thief. So make sure to go to Destroyer1320.com using promo code MMR for 15% off and get your theft deterrent system TDS and steal the thieves hope. All right, as you're coming in and I'm coming back, please hit that like button, hit that share button, retweet, follow, subscribe on whatever platform you are watching Between the Slicks here, brought to you by Monday Morning Racer. So it's time for the burn down. Basically a editorial opinion piece, if you will. Many of you know, over watching this show and my interviews and what I've been doing in the drag racing world, that I like to think at least myself an advocate of safety and that we always need to keep safety in mind and we've got an example that safety was not taken in mind and it's something that i want to show you all and then let's discuss track safety and that is important in the light of several recent events that has happened in the drag racing world so what i'm about to show you is from christian Ramanreen, if I'm, I doubt I'm pronouncing that correctly, Christian, R-A-M-N-A-R-I-N-E YouTube channel. That's his YouTube channel, Christian Ramanreen. And this is all the way the down in the Caribbean. I first saw this on dragzine.com, and it is amazing what happens here. So, Yes, there's drag racing that happens in the Caribbean. Imagine that. Drag racing happens all over the world. And these little cars, I've seen such cars as this in person at Orlando in West Buck World War Slammer National, the second edition of it. And they are fascinating little cars. They get up, they run, but they can get out of shape just like this one. And boom. This car is completely broken up. The driver was fine, walked away, no serious injury. Look, the rear end has been sheared out of the car. The top portion of the chassis is held together well while it was split at the bottom and it being yanked out. And why did that happen? Well, it happened. Well, certainly, yes, the driver got out of shape, but that happens in any form of drag racing. It can happen at the to the best of drivers as well. The reason that occurred is because there was that gap in the wall and the car struck the edge of an open concrete barrier. And we have seen this before. And I do want to be sensitive because I know they're in the Caribbean. Maybe they don't quite have the resources that you that we do here in the States and elsewhere. But if you Look at another angle, and you can search it and see the link on dragzine.com. Shared it to Monday Morning Racer. There was that gap. There was just a fence keeping people from being on the track. If he didn't hit the wall, he would have gone through a fence and probably taken out spectators, hurting several, if not there being a fatality. But he hits that edge. It splits the car. The car is completely destroyed. And it's strange to me, and it seems like a especially in drag racing, that there are certain elements that cannot move forward 
in safety. And one of the areas I think right now are our tracks. We had situ situations where in the past, you can remember, it's in my mind that Connie Coletta had a strange incident hitting one of these strange angled walls in an opening. Gary Ormsby, I was watching it last night, I think in the 89 season up in Seattle, a very strange, or Brainerd rather, strange angled wall an opening. He hits it. We've seen many of examples of it, and there has been fatalities. You could argue that Blaine Johnson's death is one of those type of situations going off track, hitting a strange angled wall. And I find it fascinating that drag racing is one of the motorsports that we have not seen great advancements in safety in regards to the track and racing venue themselves. Oh, certainly, we have seen such great facilities that are stadium-like as Chicago and up there at Juliet and Route 66, or we've also seen the Bellagio of drag strips that was built by Bruton Smith, uh, may he rest in peace, ZMAX Dragway, and it's great, the great venue that it is for fan and racer, but we haven't seen strides made in the facilities concerning the safety, as we've seen, for example, in F1. They have gotten to a point now where there is plenty of runoff. You're going to hit softer, softer barriers. They even experimented with technology where the asphalt was more abrasive to help the cars stop. Go to the world of NASCAR. We have the safer barrier, IndyCar as well that has dramatically reduced injuries in the stock car world. Now, many have said that the safer barrier would not actually work within the drag racing world. That may very well be true. But I will say this. I think we can definitely see advancements in the safety of our facilities. And we may not see it anytime soon, but... For the sake of thinking it out and what could we do, and I'm not saying that this has got to be the case for every facility, it would be challenging, it would be tough, but there are some places out there where modern day pro mods probably do not need to run at those facilities anymore, unlike pro mods inception, where they would run at those places that they were running, you know, in the sevens and high sixes, and now they run, you know, in the threes in the eighth mile. Many facilities are way outdated in that situation. And we had the incident with Ronnie Hobbs. Car goes off track. It did, in fact, hit, hit telephone poles from what has been reported. We don't want drivers in that type of situation. So imagine the starting line, and I'm going to use baseball to some degree. Imagine the starting line is home plate. Well, what does a baseball diamond do? It fans out. Right now, drag racing walls go parallel down the whole course of the track. Well, what if from the starting line, you had a slight angle fanning out? What would this do? All of that is asphalt up to a wall, and it continues to fan out, fan out, fan out till the finish line, and then you can bring them back straight. That would give more room if anyone ever got out of shape to have more asphalt to pull the chute and never possibly touch a wall. And if they did touch a wall, you would not have the sharp angle that is so often and you get the ping pong effect. I think it would greatly decrease that. They smack the wall and then they go to the other side of the wall and smack it and then eventually come to the stop, come to a stop. Rather, what it would do if it was angled in that such way, I hypothesize is, they would hit and they would be directed straight instead of going back into another wall and it would decrease the angle therefore decrease the slowing of the g's another thing i have noticed and i firmly believe one of the situations that caused ken singleton's fire to be so bad is when that car let go funny car chaos earlier this year at ennis 
when that car let go, he had not even hit the eighth mile yet. And you really were not able to respond to that fire until he got past the quarter mile ablaze and get past whatever the first opening was. So maybe we seriously need to consider openings that are properly gapped so nobody can hit an edge, just as what happened down there in the Caribbean with that Mazda. And you've got access points. For example, someone like Alex Milodonovic, he hit the wall like half track. It's longer for emergency personnel to respond with the truck because where are the trucks usually located? They're usually located at the starting line or they're located in shutdown. Well, what if we had a safe break point for people to access? Further, I also think we've seriously got to think of some type of catch fence network not necessarily to keep the cars on track and i don't mean a catch fence right on the wall but a catch fence for the fans from shrapnel remember antron brown's incident many years ago tire sheared off and it went on down the track over the wall over whatever fencing there was and sadly struck a crew mom, crew member of a nostalgia crew i don't think that should happen at a drag strip i think it should be extremely rare and i'm glad that it is but it it shocks me that it doesn't happen more often. I think a very recent case, and thank God nobody was hurt. If you recall, Leah Pruitt in her mid-track moonshot and breakup there at St. Louis in, I believe, 2020. Well, the footage is gone now from the interwebs, as far as I know, but there was footage that the front end of that car landed near in and in stands well past the eighth mile mark. I also don't think there should be stands past the eighth mile mark. But, but you have a situation where people had, there was, there was video of they had to dodge, they had to move, they had to duck to get out of the way of the front part of that dragster spewing nitro in the air. And Warren Evans, someone that I work alongside with at Funny Car Chaos and handles the stream, he mentions that he was in the TV trailer that day and there was parts and pieces that hit the trailer at that event from leah's car so you have a situation where i think we need to think of angled walls we need to think of gaps in the walls that are properly spaced for emergency people to be able to access someone half track i think there does need to be catch fencing in, you know involved uh kenny trent mentions uh the body of robert hyde at zmax that's a great point you know funny car bodies uh, be, being blown off and going in the air and shrapnel. I have heard of fans coming back to crews and handing them spark plugs. Hey, this hit me. I'm giving it back. And they're like, oh, that was cool. But it could go wrong. And it has in the past. Another thing that I believe we also need to seriously consider is a complete relocation of poles and scoreboards. Poles and scoreboards. And Drag Racing Central, not entirely. Because if you look at Mr. Hall going over the wall, a video on my YouTube channel from PDRA Drag Racing, which is exclusively eighth mile at the lot, he had such speed, such inertia, if you will, that when he got out of shape, the shoots did not get pulled. He goes over the wall, flips and tumbles, and he still hit the scoreboard. Now, it was not a serious hit. It hit in the right spot. It really actually stopped the car, thank God, going even further and into a fence. This is a situation that in the sprint car world is a problem. You go to dirt tracks and sprint cars have become faster and faster and faster and drivers are able to reach further and further and further if they got out of shape and were in that situation right now with, for example, pro mods. I mean, whoever thought pro mods would be doing what they are doing? I just yesterday watched footage from like 2001 or 2003, and people were astonished at like, you know, a 620. And here we are in this situation. They're much faster, and they weigh as heavy as they do. So, relocation of poles and scoreboards and how would you see who has won how would you see what the times and the speeds are i think it's very simple you take 
and do stadium style scoreboards. If you go to a football stadium, you can look in many different directions and find the score. Just do that. Have the scoreboards on the tower, have the scoreboards in front of grandstands. It will serve the same purpose. And I love what Houston would do when you won, like one whole side of the track would light up and that would be the winner. I think that is something that we could still have times, mile per hour, and definitely make it easy to know who won. I think we're in a time that we have got to begin thinking about track safety for the sake of the sport and for the sake of our drivers. And there's definitely some cars that should not be running at some facilities. And we've got to take a serious look at it. And I believe in motorsports and especially in drag racing, we've got to stop saying, oh, that can't happen because it can. One last thing I want to mention is the changing of the sand pit. I wonder if anything can be done there. I remember Dan Haran, Pomona, about two years ago, no shoots, flies through the traps at Pomona, and he hits the net. And yes, the net does its job. It stops him from going off the end of the track and into the road and on the golf course. But it catches him, and it flips the funny car back over, and Dan Haran is stuck in that car because there's no way for him really to get out of a funny car in that situation. It dug, caught, and flipped back. We have also seen people die from being impaled with the steering shaft going into the sand pit and the net. And granted, there's other failures happening in that situation for that to happen. What if we would experiment with a hydraulic stopping system, a water-based, chemical-infused, fire-repressant type fluid that people could hit, and when they hit, it's going to cause a splash. It can help put whatever fire out, but more than likely keep it right side up and slow the car down. And I wonder if any experiments have been done like that. All I'm saying in this editorial opinion piece, if you will, is we need to start taking a look. And in drag racing in particular, we're one of the last motorsports, I really think, other than rally, because they're just going to race wherever they race. We have not taken a great look at our venues and said, what else can we do for the racer and the fan to have them have a safe day at the track? My point's there. So we're almost near time to bring on Gabriel Burrow and talk with him. We will move Drag News to the end of the show with him after we talk to him, Gabriel Burrow. Let me dive into a few comments, and then we will bring on Mr. Burrow. Darren Williams, Jr., American Hot Red Entertainment, says, what you think about Gainesville or Orlando possibly kicking off the 2023 NHRA season? So uh, that is a part of the rumor mill that was actually mentioned on the Competition Plus Power Hour. Uh, Darren, I will say if they've got to do it for the sake of helping the teams out, I can understand it. I am not the biggest fan from it from the standpoint of tradition. I am fine with moving the finals wherever they want to move the finals because that race has traditionally moved around. I am not a fan of moving the Winter Nationals from the first date of the calendar race season for the Camping World Touring Series because, well, it's the traditional date. I mean, sure, we've had a situation, sure, we had the change during COVID, but it was COVID. I think that they could work out and do something as they did similar this year. And I feel like it really worked out. They did Phoenix, Pomona, then Phoenix. There's a mini little tour right there and throw in Vegas. I definitely agree, though. We do not need to do this mini Western swing, one East Coast race, and then go back to Vegas. That is not helping the teams at all. Granted, if a move like this is made, I definitely think it has to be Gainesville because it is the Gator Nationals. It is a crown jewel of the sport of NHRA drag racing. And I think Orlando would just be tough. Orlando already has a short shutdown area for the Pro Mod. And for the pro stock guys, 
it would need work. I have been there. I have attended races there. I'm not sure they could park everybody. I'm not, I don't think there's enough asphalt. They would need to update the bathroom situation. I do not count Orlando as a national event caliber track. There, I said it. And I say it because I've been there and I've filmed there and it would take work. Now, that is work that definitely someone like Ozzy Moya could get done but I'm not sure that it could get done in time for the 2023 season. I think it would naturally have to be Gainesville. It would have to be because it's owned by the NHRA and all that they have invested in that place. Very quickly, Drag Racing Central says, that's a track issue running eighth mile at a 1320 track like my home track, Maple Grove, for example. No door slammer FC for that matter is going to fly for six, 660 feet to hit the scoreboards. You don't know that. And remember, the incident with Ronnie Hobbs took place at a quarter mile track and yet still hit poles. Remember Drag Racing Central, I say it often on this track, you can't say never in motorsports. It tends to show that freak occurrences are often not that freakish. Pat, I've always thought that there should be fire nozzles controlled by the safety crew. Place them on top of the wall with solenoids to be activated at the part of the track where needed. I mean, just, I think we need to think outside the box. That is my argument. How to make the track itself safer. Because think how many cars might have been saved if the walls were fanned out and drivers had that much more room to save the car. And now, sure, you keep the width of a drag strip lane the same. You just paint a line. And if you're like, oh, well, how will they know where the finish line is? More paint. And you showcase that. And then that even provides a marketing opportunity for individuals to have the, I don't know, you've got that situation where Tum sponsors like the heartbreak turn there at the Roval. Well, you can have the blank, blank, such su shutdown area, and it's painted a certain color. And when drivers get through that, boom, they know to pull the chute, cut the car off. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a break. And right after this break, we're going to have the most recent winner in a gas, Mr. Gabriel Burrow on the 2021 Southeast Gassers Association, a gas champion to have a chat with him on his win and his year so far in 2022 competition. This word from Power Built Tools. Power Built Tools exemplifies innovation in the tool industry. From hand tools, power tools, and even tool storage. Check out PowerBuilt.com for Power Built Tools. And remember, use promo code MMR15 for 15% off at purchase. Mr. Burrell, how's it going, man? Good, how are you? Man, I'm doing great. I'm doing great, and it is uh, definitely good to have you on once again. Thank you for being uh, no stranger to the show. You've been on several times, and I appreciate that. Uh, the last time I was not able to have be on with you, I had Darren Williams Jr., American Hot Rod Entertainment, uh, chiming in, and he did a great job. So, man... Um, you come in as the defending champion, and seems like first part of 2022, it's been kind of rough for you. 22 was, I guess, the roughest season in a couple of years to start out with. Uh, just couldn't buy a break, couldn't get any luck. Anything that could go wrong did go wrong. Just fault constant. Just little issues, nothing major, but just little issues every race that kept us from being where we needed to be. And uh, finally got the monkey off our back last race and had a couple breaks go our way and worked our way down to the finals and put it in the winner's circle. Yes, you definitely did that. Now, going into the season and after several events now, have you felt that bullseye on your back as the champion, unlike any other time before? 
to be honest, the bullseye was probably worse last season at this point in time than it is now. I mean, right now I'm chasing. Jason's way better than being up front and everybody there gunning for you right now. I'm just out here having fun and running the best I can. Uh, if I was up front, maybe a little different story, but right now, I mean, there's a, a definite target and I'm just racing towards it. Uh, there's another man a few miles down the road that's got the big target on his back. So just looking for that ball. Yeah, I imagine you're talking about Leslie Horn. He has definitely been on a roll. I believe it's three straight. Uh, what has yourself and the other competitors in A-Gas thought about Leslie's rip here lately in competition of Southeast Gassers? You were breaking up. I couldn't hear much of what you said. I don't know if I'm, my internet's going away or what here. All right, you're good. You're good. So what have y'all thought about Leslie's run so far of winning as many straight as he has? I mean, he's had the storybook season this year like I had the start of last year uh he done what he should do done a great job driving and every single thing that needed to go his way went his way and and he capitalized on it he put it in the winner's circle and not taking anything away from it i mean it's a great run uh that that's what everybody's after is put two three four in a row in in the closet before we get mid-season uh but luckily i was able to hang around close enough that he couldn't shut the door on me before we got got down here to the final run. So, Gabriel, look, you have, I think, one of the most beautiful cars out there in Southeast Gassers competition, in a gas in particular. Love the hot rod that you have got. So give us the breakdown once again of your machine and also any changes from 2021 to 2022. Um, it's just... Uh set of stock copy Model A rails, uh, chop Model A body that should have been a flower bed steel. Um, it's the car is fairly light. It's a chromoly cage. Everything we can do to get the weight out of it. It's got a 407 inch John Cosby small block forward, uh, Ram clutch and a, a G-Force G101A with a nine inch. Uh, nothing super special. It just, it all works good together. Um, and as far as for the rest of the season plans, it's sitting right over there on the cherry picker. Going to put it in tomorrow night, hopefully. So we'll we'll see what happens. But uh, we got a new power plant just picked up today. So hopefully it'll be enough to have a little fun with them big blocks. Show that again. I still have the picture up. So let, let me see that. I don't know how good a picture it is. It's on the cherry picker over there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's all wrapped up in plastic. We drove through some rain coming back from Georgia, so it's wrapped up in plastic. But uh, I hope it's going to be the ticket to, to give us that little bit of edge we need right now. We're still – we're close, but we're a few hundreds behind where we, where we should be to run up front. So I hope that's going to be the ticket. Is it another John Causey power plant? It's a 440 cubic inch uh, iron head, mechanically injected small block. Uh, just trying to take advantage of all the weight breaks we could, get the iron head weight break and a mechanical injection break, and pick up a few cubic inches in the process. So hopefully it'll hopefully it'll be the ticket. Not sure yet, but it looked good so far. I like that using the rule book to your advantage any way you can. And look, talk to me about working with John Causey. He has been around for a long time in the engine, you know, building world. And, you know, he made a post from his Facebook of his race shop, his engine shop that, you know, you were included amongst Johnny Placino and others that had winning weekends. So you get mentioned right there along with someone in extreme pro stock. I mean, growing up, John Cosby was one of those names. Quain was racing pro stock, I mean, pro mod, and Mitch was racing pro mod. And John Cosby was one of those names from age five that I knew. Uh, he was my Ford hero you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. He was my Ford hero. And then getting to work with him, just amazing that he's willing to work on our projects and take this this last engine that's been his personal project for over a year. I mean, we're trying to wring everything we can out of a heads up, naturally aspirated combo to run with the best that Gene Fulton and Scott Duggins and 
anyone else I guess in the country right now can produce. I mean, we're we're on the cutting edge of 1970s technology, if that makes sense. Uh, so it's really cool to get John so involved in something like this, and you know, we talk on a weekly basis and and run ideas. You know, I run my ideas past each other, and we I seen the ladder sheets in the race. So it's really cool to be this involved with him. It's just you know, a dream come true getting to work with a hero like that. So Farmington, the conditions were challenging. I think at one point the track temp was hovering around 160 degrees before going into eliminations. What did you think about the track? What did you have to do with the car? And what was Farmington like beyond the win? What were the challenges to uh, go on and get that trophy? To be honest, I was thrilled to see density altitude above 3,000 feet and racetrack temps at 160. That's kind of a something to level out the playing field when, when you know you're down some power on some of those uh, other guys. That It's nice to see something like that because then you can start doing the chassis to, to get from A to B where they have more time, trouble doing it because they're up 100 horse or whatever they're up. Uh, to be honest, I was glad to see these. I guess miserable conditions if you really look at it, but the car works good. It doesn't slow down a whole lot when we when we get on a bad racetrack or a, a bad day. So I was I was thrilled with it. And the car worked great. I mean it sixty foot was within two hundreds and I think every pass we made all day Saturday during eliminations was within three hundred. So I couldn't have asked for any more out of out of the car. So you're saying you're a summer tuner. Give me the hot conditions. I don't know that I'm a summer tuner, but the car responds well to summer conditions. It it doesn't really care whether it's hot or cold. I mean, wintertime, yeah, I can pick up a few hundreds, but it's not. I, I can't I can't fatten it up and pick up a tent. There's there's not that much in it. It's I've got what I've got pretty much every racetrack. So, yeah, I mean, shady side, we're we're down five or six hundreds from shady side maybe, but that's near the worst hour we're probably running all season. So, it's good to me. I, the other guys seem to slow down more than it does my car. So. I kind of look forward to them. Well, that is certainly a good combination to have when it gets hot and sticky because I think there's just as many races in those conditions, if not more, than the ideal conditions. And Farmington definitely was warm. So what I'm going to do now, Gabriel, we're going to bring up round one, and then we're going to go through each round, and we're going to talk about it round by round, and you ultimately getting the win. win pretty handedly and easily it seems like there but good to see newcomers coming into the category for sure yeah that, i mean that's uh higginbotham guys first race uh cool car cool name uh got a ways to go but we've all been there uh it was an easier round but we all started somewhere so that when you qualify top part of the field that's what you get first round but like i said it was it was a fun race and I expect him to be up front here before too very long when he gets some seat time and, and gets the car where it needs to be. Gabriel, looks like to me, one, in Southeast Gas or Association competition in like A Gas, it seems like you've got a lot of Chevy twos you got to knock out of the way. It seems like you can have a Chevy two almost every round, but it looks like over a lot of the day, uh, you were not out, just out pacing, but you were out driving. Seems like you were leaving first. That round did not leave first. That was Dean Jonas, uh, master fabricator for Tony Mooney and 
he don't leave you much on the tree. Uh, he actually left on me a touch that round, but he does every round. But just, I had enough to get back around him by second gear, so it makes it look a little better. But for the most part, yes, that race, I guess the race was won basically on a hole shot there in the in the semis. But that round, I can't lie to you and tell you I left on him because I didn't. <laughs> well, still stellar driving to at least keep it close where you can pull around and, and get it done. And, you know, you mentioned, hey, cool car coming in with Higginbotham, and I just mentioned there there's a lot of Chevy 2s, which nothing's wrong with that. What's something combination-wise and body-wise that you might like to see in a gas competition? Though not beating you, but at least to enjoy that it's out there. I think we need some Henry J's, and we also need a – I would love to see an Austin A40 out there. I think that, that those are cars that belong. Uh, need a couple uh, 41 Willis out there. I mean, those are those are the cars that would have been there in the 67 era. But I would love to see somebody come out with an Austin, and I'm glad to see him out with a Henry J now. Uh, those are cars from the golden era of the gas racing that we need to have out there for fans to see. For, for sure. Good choices. All right. close yeah that was a whole shot win there i had i think i had him four on the tree and he had me two on et so it was a close race uh he qualified number two and he was throughout the day he was give or take three or four hundred faster than me most every round so i was glad to squeak by that one uh that was that was the one i wasn't supposed to win that race so it's good to get that that break falling in your pocket now, by this time, Leslie has gone out, the points leader, the one, you know, seemingly walking away with this championship points lead. Do you, in that moment, sense the pressure, hey, I've got an opportunity to get more points and make this thing closer and give myself a shot? No, we're starting up in the season. I mean, of course, the points are always in the back of your head, but I was just out there racing this race. I mean, if we win, we win. If we, if, we, if we get by him, we get by him. But it's just I'm trying to run my race still at this point. There's, there's not a whole lot of, of necessarily strategy going on yet. It's just A to B and, and try to be the last one standing. And speaking of the last one standing, let's take a look at the final round. And you were just that, hoisting the trophy at the end of the day. easy way to win them <laughs> it was an easy win i think todd felt like he had to take a shot at the tree to beat me but in reality i think he was a lot closer to me than he thought he was there uh if, if he waited on this i think it'd have been a lot you know would have obviously been a better drag race than it was but i was glad to pull second gear and see the w on the tree already so i went ahead and ran it through for the fans but it felt good uh and it was Best case scenario for, for the ladder to work out for me, and then everything worked good going through it. So it, just, it was our race. So the next race up for Southeast Gasser Association competition, if I remember correctly, is in Lyons, Indiana. Have you been to, I'm sure you've been to that track, but how has it treated you? The racetrack's always been great to me. I mean, even before, we're talking four or five years ago, I made a final round there in AGAS get some good stiff competition uh before i had the combo i have now uh i hate getting there but i love once we're there 
it's a miserable ride, but it's a great racetrack, great facility, and everybody's great. The track's always been really good to me. Awesome, awesome. Well, I'm sure you're looking forward to getting up there, continuing the success that you've already had, begin, you know, with a championship, getting a win now, and other than just going out and winning every race that is left, what do you got to do to keep this championship battle close and become the first repeat back-to-back -back champion in Southeast Gasser Association competition? I mean, as of right now, I'm just, I'm just going to run – run my race and, and and hopefully we rise to the top it you know when it gets on down farther we'll play games but i mean obviously the the easy answer is i've got to go more rounds than leslie does uh whatever that takes i mean if he'll get beat first round we can have a miserable race but if he goes to the finals i've got to be there and, and, and put it in the winter circle in front of him it uh you know it's it's a two or three part story there it's not only what i do but what he has to do so I guess it depends on, on where we're at as it, as it trickles down. But my honest goal is, is I'd like to win two or three more this season. Well, winning two or three more would definitely keep you in the hunt, even possibly put you ahead. I'm curious, do you, the other drivers, people in the Southeast Gasters Association, do y'all kind of stand in awe that over 11-something years there's never been, out of all the categories, a repeat champion whatsoever. I mean, it. it I guess it's just a testament to the to the rule book and, and how everything's laid out. That it's hard to put something in front back to back to back and and to string them along for two and three seasons. Uh, the combo I have now, I'm lucky enough that that it's been good enough to to run with the front of the pack for going on three seasons now. But everybody picks up every winter, so. The, the guy that was on top of the totem pole last year, I mean, if if he didn't pick up three or four or five hundreds, he's he's third or fourth qualifier this year. So, yeah, I mean, it. I, I guess it's a little odd that nobody's been able to do it. But looking back, it. I mean, it makes sense. Every everybody. I mean, it's we may not be pro mod racing or or top fuel funny racing, but there's nearly as much work going into this every off season, just trying to get cars faster as, as those guys are doing. So. It, it stands to make sense that we are where we are. So uh, we've got a few comments from those that are wa watching. Dalton Pettis says, this car should be named Bronco Billy the way it goes down the track. You've got an interesting hopper uh, of, of a car down through the drag strip. Describe for us. I know you can't put us all in the cockpit, but try to describe what it's like manhandling your beautiful Ford. To me, it feels like it, it looks worse outside the car than it does inside the car. I mean, it it's a little ill. I I don't have a lot of experience in things that that handle great, so I don't. I guess I don't have. I'm not spoiled by anything that that goes A to B perfectly. I mean, it it has its own mind and it moves, but it responds to steering input. It it responds to everything. It just if you'll do your part, it'll it'll do what you ask it to within reason. And Kenny Trent got an interesting observation. He says those full-bodied cars look very big beside his car in reference to your car. So is there really that drastic of a difference between the dimensions of your car compared to the other? Or is that kind of just almost an optical illusion? That mine looks bigger? Yes. Or, or yours looks smaller compared to theirs. Uh, in reality, I, I, I guess the... Uh, Maybe the overall profile may be a little narrower, but it's, I mean, it's eight inches taller than Leslie's 55 when it sits on the racetrack. Uh, all the Chevy 2s, I mean, I, you know, you could put another person on top of the Chevy 2 and it'd still be about the same same profile as, as the roof line on my car. Uh, it looks like it sits low because of those uh, rails and the running boards and all, but in reality, the chassis, I think, is about six inches higher than than most of the Chevy 2s and 55s out there running with us. What about wheelbase wise? Are you sure? I'm sure you, I imagine you're shorter than most of them. Oh yeah, we're significantly shorter. We're like a 103 inch wheelbase, something like that. Uh, us and the Henry J and Kenneth Silver Street Corvette, we're all in the same little ballpark there as far as 
as far as wheelbase wise. I think the Chevy twos are one ten, and I think a fifty five is one seventeen or something. So they've got a whole lot more wheelbase than we do. All right. So you know, right now in Southeast Gasser Association competition. You know, people are going to look at you and they're going to be like top dog. They're going to look at Leslie, top dog. They're going to mention Varner and Phillips. Who's somebody within Southeast Gasser Association racing that's up and coming? Everybody's like, we need to watch out for this guy or gal. I mean, in reality, Dean Jonas is the one of the best drivers in A-Gas, hands down. I mean, I would guess his average lot on me in the last season is probably uh, – 015 or something maybe i mean he, he leaves the last race before this one we ran each other at i had a 018 light and he had a 013 light on me i think i mean he's he's just a a tick more performance before he's putting everybody on the trailer because he leaves nothing else there i mean if, if he had three or four more hundreds there's nothing i can do with him ouch watch out competition watch out so, Gabriel, look, you've got the new power plant. You've shown that. What are y'all going to do testing-wise, if any, or are y'all going to go straight to the track and let that be your testing opportunities? Uh, we'll probably rent Shady Side one day next week and go make a few test passes and uh, see where we're at. And hopefully before next race, we'll probably make, in reality, two, two good all-day test sessions at Shady Side just to, to see where we're at because I know where the – old motor would be at there on most any given day i've ran there so much so i'd like to test there and and just see see how the cards stack and uh if it looks like that we've got something more potent than we had we'll go to the next race if not we'll we'll backpedal and put the old engine back in it and tune on this one till we think we have something that can run up front all right. Well, I would, uh, it would not be wise of me not to take opportunity and mention backup girls in the midst of the Southeast Gasser Association. You've got a lovely young lady that's backing you up. So take time to, you know, share who she is and uh, how long she's been doing it. Um, she's my fiance, Katie Jackson. She's been doing it for, I guess, over a little over two years now. Uh, I, I brought her to the first race maybe a week or two after I met her. Actually, the first real date we had after the first night was going to pick up a trailer to haul the race car in. So she's been around it since the first day I met her, and uh, she's turned into the finest backup girl in all the association for sure. And uh, she puts me exactly where I need to be every round, and there's no question whether whether I'm where I should be when she walks away. So that's one less thing on my mind every time before I before I go to to ease into the beams. I know I'm I'm where I think I am. All right, man. Well, look, I'm going to give you the floor. And you just say thank you to whoever you need to say thank you to for the win and for just being able to get behind the wheel of a beautiful time machine like that. And feel free to even thank yourself and do the old Snoop Dogg thing. <laughs> uh, first off, we've got to thank uh, Robbie and Nancy Bird and the back of the car here, the whole reason they support uh, – put some money into the car was to raise awareness for breast cancer. Uh, she survived breast cancer and they were in a financial position to, to put this car up front and with the ability to raise awareness for breast cancer. So first and foremost, they're on top and then Jack and Patsy Mills help and Jack works on the car, uh, at the races come to most every race, uh, Burroughs golf cart, John Holbert login, Scott wire, Fox Ford, uh, Hammond Moody's been helping out a little bit on a little bit of stuff. And then G4 Transmission, Roby Myrick, uh, G4 South, he's second to none as far as customer service goes. And then John Cozzi Racing Engines, like I already said before, he's a hero. And obviously he builds an engine that's more than capable of doing anything you ask it to do. I mean, I turn this thing 9,500 every race and it's got three seasons on it almost. It's, it's, a, it's, it's amazing what, what it can do. Uh, I guess those are the ones I have to thank first and foremost. And then Wayne and Mitch and all those that help keep the Southeast gassers functioning from race to race. So we have somewhere to race. All right. Well said, Mr. Burl. Look, thank you once again for coming on the show. I appreciate you not being a stranger and, uh, 
hopefully we get tired of seeing each other. That means you won a lot, and I've been to a lot of Southeast Gasser Association races, and hope you have a great rest of the season, and I'm looking forward to a good championship battle, man. Yeah, I, I hope it. I hope the cards fall our way these next few races, and we can come back talk to you here late November, uh, about a two in a row, but we're just going to take them one at a time as, as we are right now and, and see if we can stack two, three, four wins up this season to, to try to get to that end goal. All right. Well, Southern Flyer, thank you for your time, man. Have a good night. Thank you. All right, folks. That's the 2021 AGAS champion in Southeast Gasser Association competition, Gabriel Burrell. Thanks you for your time, Mr. Burrell. And ladies and gentlemen, we're not done with the show. I went a little longer in that burn down session. I think it was an important topic. We're going to take a break. Drag News is next, wrapping up Between the Slicks. <laughs> All right, in drag news, what is happening out there in the world of drag racing? Mav TV and Flow Racing, they announced an, a partnership, an agreement to have Mav TV Plus footage programming aired on Flow Racing. So that means such things as the Lucas Oil late model dirt series and the chili bow nationals and more that is usually on mav tv plus can now be viewed on flow racing and when it comes to flow racing i do want you all to understand and i've been able to see it behind the scenes firsthand unlike ever before because well i put material on flow racing for funny car chaos being their pit reporter streaming is not tv do not equate it yet to that it is a complete, completely different set of equipment, and there's another set of challenges when it comes to streaming and flow racing and Mav TV Plus. And often what's happening is you have a situation where people have been contracted out. They're actually not even flow employees, and they're streaming to and through flow racing. What this does say, though, is the late the recent hiring of Courtney Enders for more drag racing content, more on flow racing, this partnership being crafted is that flow racing is attempting to continue to grow and bring better and better content and footage to you and I as motorsports fans. And that is a good thing. Steve Torrance has been nominated for an ESPY. The Best Driver of the Year Award. He is nominated for that. Voting will take place. Awards will go out later this July. And I will say it's good that we have this representation from Drag Racing and it being Steve Torrance, four-time top field champion. But I definitely believe it's going to be hard to beat out Kyle Larson of NASCAR fame with the year that he had last year. It seemed like any and everything that he got in, he won. Whether it was a sprint car, whether it was a micro sprint, whether it was a dirt late model, whether it was a NASCAR. Heck, if they put him in Greg Anderson's pro stock car, I think he might have even nabbed a Wally for the heck of it. But I'm glad to see that drag racing gets this recognition on a world leader in sport news coverage, ESPN. And it's not a new thing. You know, recently even Erica Enders has been up for that award. But it's good to see that Steve Torrance is slotted for that. He has been nominated. Matt Hagen has got news on the marketing side of matters. Baja Vida beef jerky and snacks they are going to be the primary sponsor at worldwide technology raceway for the nhra midwest national september 30th through october 2nd and this particular brand will also be a associate an associate sponsor for the rest of the year so you can see them on the spill plate later on at other races and that is always great to see new marketing partners coming into the sport of drag racing wherever they might be going in now 
you have this article. I'm pulling from Competition Plus and condensing it. Be sure to take time to go to competitionplus.com and read Darren Williams Jr. of American Hot Rod Entertainment pinned it and posted it. And that is the Nanook Fuel Altered Clan. They are definitely famous for this beautiful fuel altered. Kyle Huff, you see him right here. He's been behind the wheel for many, many years. They are going to take upon a new endeavor in the world of drag racing, and they are going to go nostalgia, top fuel, front engine style drag racing. The article, to me, didn't seem clear whether they were going to have anything to do with the fuel altered later on, but they are going to make this shift and change. And if and you can definitely expect them to be major players in the front engine dragster scene because they were major players in the fuel altered scene. All right, we'll close out the show by going to the comments and seeing what you all have to say. Kenny Trent says, good interview. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Rob McClaskey says, go Gabe. I definitely think he is going to do that. I think we've got a championship battle on our hands in the Southeast Gasser Association. Uh, Brodus Roland says, powered by Ford. That it is, a John Causey engine. And Drag Racing Central, Steve won't win. Hate to say it. Max is going to kill everyone in ESPYs. Nah, I think Kyle. I think Kyle, I think he's going to get the nod. I think that will be the case. But nonetheless, we're not voting. There definitely could be a ESPN F1 lean. There'd be some controversy there for sure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Between the Slicks. I'm your host, Lee Craft, Monday Morning Racer. Thank you for being here. We will be back here next Thursday. Be sure to tell a friend. Let's come together, talk drag racing, and enjoy the news, the opinion, and the guests right here on Between the Slicks, all on and about drag racing. Until next time, God bless and keep the pedal to the metal.